This is a show with no particular niche, baby. It's always about hanging out. Maybe we'll laugh at some stuff. Maybe we'll learn something new. But it's always about hanging out, me and you. Hi, hello, and welcome to That Thing with James, a podcast about nothing in particular. I'm your host, James. And today, today's topic is aliens. Yes, uh, specifically the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is not a new thing, but there is a newer within the realm of SETI altogether, the SETI Institute, and there is a theory uh, we're going to get into that I, I've actually had for a long time, uh, but it turns out I'm not the only one. So that's what we're getting into today. But first, a little bit of business. Uh, let's see. This week, I think I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Yes, this week, right now, there are 90 bonus episodes. Yes, this week is the premiere of the 90th, 90th bonus episode of this podcast. And if you'd like to get access to all 90 of those, plus the peace of mind that comes from supporting an independent artiste, an independent creator. I'm talking about myself here. The show could use your support. And in return, you will, you will get access to all 90 bonus episodes, plus some other extra content at patreon.com slash that thing with James. That's patreon.com slash that thing with James. Um, it's just $5 is the bare minimum for 30 days of access to all 90 bonus episodes. And if you feel like uh, donating a little bit more, then there are other perks I offer with the different donation tiers. But uh, the bare minimum entry is just $5. Only $5 and you'll get access to all 90 bonus episodes and uh, extra content that I have at patreon.com slash that thing with James. Uh, the link is written in the episode description for this episode, uh, as are the um, links to my social media. I'm on TikTok and Instagram. Wait, 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 Twitter and Instagram, though, honestly, I've not been using Twitter for a long time. It's just, uh, it was a slow downhill, uh, uh, it was a slow decline, and then a very rapid decline once it was bought out by a certain dumbass. Uh, but I'm on Instagram. I'm, I'm relatively, well, I'm certainly more active on there than on, on Twitter. I refuse to call it the new one-letter name. It's just so fucking stupid. Regardless... I'm on Instagram, at James J. Asher. Uh, you can also find me on TikTok, also at, at James J. Asher. Now, I have another TikTok account called at TTWJ Productions. Um, and I've been talking about this for like two months, but I have yet to do it. I'm still thinking about phasing it out and just consolidating everything into the username I've had forever, at James J. Asher. But... Yeah, I've been doing this thing on my regular James J. Asher TikTok where I do, uh, I summarize episodes of Star Trek. And specifically right now, I'm re-watching The Next Generation, but it's Star Trek summarized in one paragraph or less. And that's pretty fun. I'll summarize an episode in one paragraph or less. Um, but yeah, patreon.com slash that thing with James. Support the show, get a bunch of bonus content and find me on Fuck it. Let's forget about Twitter. Find me on Instagram and TikTok at James J. Asher. I have a subreddit, r slash that thing with James. And you can contact me at the show email with questions and uh, ideas for topics for me to cover on this here show. Um, it is that thing with James at gmail.com. And once again, all that stuff is written in the episode description now. On with today's topic, aliens, specifically the search for, well, extraterrestrial intelligence, 
S-E-T-I is the uh, uh, acronym SETI. Um, now, I've pulled up a few links. I've sort of scanned over them. I have not gone through and read them in granular detail. I have not come up with bullet points or a script for this, uh, for this show, um, because time is money and I am short on both of those things. However, uh, if, if you've been following the show for a while, then you know I like to just fly by the seat of my pants. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to open these links that I have saved, and uh, we're going to fly through and, and pick out some gems as we go along. So let me get a sip of water, wet my whistle, open these links, and then we will get on with the show. Just a second. Okay, my sweetings, let's get on with this topic. Um, now, before we jump in, I want to preface with how I arrived at this topic. So about a week ago, however, by the time this episode comes out, it will have been two weeks ago, um, I started re-watching, I, I have, still haven't finished it yet, I'm like halfway through, the first of the series of movies, uh, the first movie titled Species. It is a sci-fi from the 90s, and it's very sexy. And I first saw it in the early 2000s. I think uh, my dad got the DVD, and I watched it with my parents, and I was just, my, I, my face was flushed. I was embarrassed. I kept covering my well, the side of my head, so my parents couldn't see me ogling the screen because it is a very naked and sexy, scary sci-fi. All the great things that make for a good sci-fi. You've got um, you've got speculative science fiction and uh, a sexy lady getting naked and doing fucky wucky stuff. Yeah, yeah, species. Pretty good movie. Pretty good stars. Like you, you watch it and you'll say, "Oh my god, that that person. Oh, and that person. Whoa, they're all in this. Yeah, they're all in it." And uh, and that alien, this alien takes on the form of it basically will eat a human and embody its body. It'll walk around in its skin. It's kind of like that movie uh, Under the Skin, but uh, pff, like two, three decades earlier. Um, and yeah, so I, I was first introduced to this movie by my parents who watched it, and I was just like, oh my God, I want to watch this, absolutely. Just not with my parents. Um, I might have been like 13 or something. Um, but I, I was cruising around on streaming platforms and I saw that it was on one. I don't remember which one. And I, uh, you know, I got halfway through, but at the very beginning, at the very beginning, it starts at this place called SETI, S-E-T-I. And, or is it SETI? Fuck it. I've been calling it SETI. We're going to call it SETI, S-E-T-I. And I was like, I think that's a real thing. I think I've heard of SETI. I'm pretty sure that's a real like place. So I did a little quick, uh, you know, uh, web searching Kung Fu. And sure enough, I found out that, yeah, SETI is a sort of activity and everything. And it's been around for a long time. But there's also a place called the SETI Institute located in California. And I think that place opened in the 80s, maybe. But we're going to get into this. I'm starting on we're doing Wikipedia. Come on, come on. We're doing Wikipedia. If I was going to go down the rabbit hole with like more in-depth articles, then the show would need a, a whole sub-series of episodes. And, and again, time and money that I don't have. So, so we're going to cruise the wiki. All right. So let's start off with SETI itself. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a collective term for scientific searches for intelligent extra, extraterrestrial life or 
as the dude with the wild hair from Ancient Aliens. Great show, mind you. Uh, 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 Sukulos, is that his name? Something Sukulos? Um, he says extraterrestrial, not extraterrestrial, but he says intelligent extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial life. For example, monitoring electromagnetic radiation for signs of transmissions from civilizations from other planets. Um, that's also like that other movie, um, Signal, is that what it was called from the late 90s, early 2000s? With, um, oh God, oh, what's her name? Clarice, whatever. Uh, let's keep moving. Scientific investigation began shortly after the advent of the radio in the early 1900s and focused international efforts have been ongoing since the 1980s. In 2015, Stephen Hawking and Israeli billionaire Yuri Milner announced the Breakthrough Listen Project, BLP. I wonder what kind of sandwich that would be. Bacon, lettuce, potato. A $100 million 10-year attempt to detect signals from nearby stars. So let's get into the history. Early work. There have been many earlier searches for extraterrestrial intelligence within the solar system. In 1896, Nikola Tesla, whom I've covered more than once on this show, and I know this article is going to get into it, Marconi um, devised. Uh, Marconi is not the first person to think up the radio. That was Tesla. But Tesla came up with it around the time that U.S. government, a.k.a. big business, was shutting him down. And then maybe five years later or so, Marconi came out with the radio. And he is often, albeit technically incorrectly, attributed as being the inventor of the radio. No, he was just the first person to get the product out but the first person to think it up, schematics, so on and so forth, that was Tesla. He just got screwed before he could get the product out. Anyway, anyway, in 1896, Nikola Tesla suggested that an extreme version of his wireless electrical transmission system could be used to contact uh, beings on Mars. <laughs> In 1899, while conducting experiments at his Colorado Springs experimental station, which, mind you, uh, people watching, I'm wearing a, a hoodie. I've had this thing for decades now, I think, at this point. Breckenridge. Breckenridge, baby. Breckenridge, Colorado. I'm a Colorado baby, born and partially raised. Yep, I'm from Denver. I've got family in Colorado Springs, you know. There's some alien shit. People, people are a mile high in all sorts of ways in Colorado, man. Anyway, um, in 1899, while conducting experiments at his Colorado Springs experimental station, he, uh, Tesla, thought he had detected a signal from Mars since an odd repetitive static signal seemed to cut off when Mars set uh, when Mars set in the night sky. Analysis of Tesla's research has led to a range of explanations, including one, Tesla simply misunderstood the new technology he was working with, two, that he may have been observing signals from Marconi's European radio experiments, and three, an and even speculation that he could have picked up naturally occurring radio noise caused by the moon of Jupiter, Io, moving through the magnetosphere of Jupiter, which, uh, by the way, something for you to look up, you can find them on YouTube. The um, electromagnetic waves, the pulses of the various planets and moons and the star of our solar system, 
have been transposed quite a while ago, uh, sort of transposed, translated from electromagnetic waves into sound waves. So you can go on YouTube and first, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel, That Thing With James, or just type in, uh, it's like, just search at TTWJ, you'll find it. And then once you've done that and subscribed to my show and, and my Patreon and watched all the stuff I've made, um, then you can go on and listen to the sounds of the bodies, the celestial bodies of our solar system. It's amazing. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, Neptune sounds terrifying. It's like a bunch of screams of water creatures, drowners or something, if you will. Moving on, in the early 1900s, uh, Guglielmo, Guglielmo Marconi, why couldn't he just be Guillermo? Gug Guglielmo, <laughs> Guglielmo Marconi, Lord Kelvin, and David Peck Todd also stated that uh, stated their belief that radio could be used to contact Martians with Marconi stating that his stations had also picked up potential Martian signals. On August 21st through 23rd in 1924, Mars entered an opposition closer to Earth than at any time in the century before or over the next 80 years. In the United States, a National Radio Silence Day was promoted during a 36-hour period from August 21 to 23, with all radios quiet for five minutes on the hour every hour. At the U.S. Naval Observatory, a radio receiver was lifted three kilometers, that's 1.9 miles, above ground in a dirigible, oh, I love that word, dirigible, <laughs> tuned to a wavelength between 8 and 9 km, uh, using a quote-unquote radio camera developed by Amherst College and Charles Francis Jenkins. The program was led by David Peck Todd with the military assistance of Admiral Edward W. Eberle, uh, Chief of Naval, Naval Operations, with William F. Friedman, Chief Cryptographer of the U.S. Army, assigned to translate any potential Martian messages. Now, this is what I would like to see, a concerted effort of all uh, international powers, instead of fighting with each other, instead of committing genocide on the Palestinians, why can't we like work together and search for new knowledge, much like the Starship Enterprise? It only makes sense. It only makes sense to me. Anyway, a 1959 paper by Philip Morris. Hmm. Oh, Morrison, my bad. Philip Morrison and Giuseppe Coccioni first pointed out the possibility of searching the microwave spectrum. It proposed frequencies and, and a set of initial targets. In 1960, Cornell University astronomer Frank Drake performed the first SETI experiment named Project Ozma. Ooh. After the Queen of Oz, oh, Ozma, Project Ozma, after the Queen of Oz and L. Frank Baum's fantasy books, Drake all used a radio telescope 26 meters, that's 85 feet in diameter, at Green Bank, West Virginia, to examine the stars of Tau Ceti, C E T I, and Epsilon Eridani near the 1.420, nice bruh, gigahertz marker frequency. A region of the radio spectrum dubbed the quote unquote 
water hole due to its proximity to the hydrogen and hydroxyl ray radical spectral lines. I don't know what that shit means. A 400 kilohertz band around the marker frequency was scanned using a single channel receiver with a bandwidth of 100 hertz. He found nothing interesting, nor did I in that paragraph. <laughs> oh yeah, here we go, baby. Soviet scientists took a strong interest in SETI during the 1960s and performed a number of searches with omnidirectional antennas in, hope, in the hope of picking up powerful radio signals. Soviet astronomer uh, Yosef Shklovsky uh, Josef Shklovsky wrote the pioneering book in the field, Universe, Life, Intelligence, published in 1962, which was expanded upon by America, American astronomer Carl Sagan at, as the best-selling book, Intelligent Life in the Universe, published in 1966. Socialists for the win. Socialists understanding that instead of fighting with each other, we should be uh, spearheading the search for new life and new knowledge and new understanding of what it is to exist and what exists in and around us. It only makes sense. Getting passionate. In the March 1955 issue of Scientific American, John D. Krauss described an idea to scan the cosmos. Yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. Let's skip ahead. SETI, Meta, and Beta. In 1980, Carl Sagan, Bruce Murray, and Louis Friedman founded the U.S. Planetary Society partly as a vehicle for SETI studies. In the early 1980s, Harvard University physis physicist Paul Horowitz, I've read about him, took the next step and proposed the design from a, of a spectrum analyzer specifically intended to search for SETI transmissions. Traditional desktop spectrum analyzers were of little use for this job as they sampled frequencies using banks of analog filters and so were restricted in the number of channels they could acquire. However, modern integrated circuit digital signal processing, DSP, technology could be used to build autocorrelation receivers to check far more channels. This work led in 1981 to a portable spectrum analyzer named Suitcase SETI that had a capacity of 131,000 narrow band channels. After field tests that lasted into 1982, Suitcase SETI was put to use in 1983 with a 26-meter Harvard-Smithsonian radio telescope at Oak Ridge Observatory in Havid, Massachusetts. This project was named Sentinel and continued into 1985. I actually believe I've uh, read about Project Sentinel. Um, some other stuff, uh, Steven Spielberg uh, helped fund uh, something uh, with the uh, Planetary Society searching in 1996 to 97, so on, so forth. I'm curious here, uh, let's skip ahead to this quantum communications. Ooh, recent, recent history. <laughs> In 2021, pre-print, uh, wait, pre-print, an astronomer described, in a 2021 pre-print, that makes more sense, an astronomer described for the first time how one could search for quantum communication transmissions sent by ETI, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence using existing telescope and receiver technology. He also proves arguments for why future searches for ETI should also target interstellar quantum communication networks. Good idea. A 2022 paper noted that interstellar quantum communication by other civilizations could 
poss- could be possible and may be advantageous, identifying some potential challenges and factors for detecting techno signatures. Uh, They may, for example, use X-ray photons for remotely established quantum communication and quantum teleportation as the communication mode. Hmm. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot more um, that I'm frankly not going to get into on this. This is a very deep topic, but I don't have a lot of time for uh, left on this episode, so... We're going to move on. We're going to read about the SETI Institute and then this theory that I've had that, I don't know, it appears a psychologist has had as well. But first, a quick water break. On with the show. Uh, now, this is this is a wiki article specifically about the SETI Institute, and uh, the name is really cool. It's a st- It starts with a stylized S that looks like a question mark, SETI Institute. Uh, The SETI Institute, pardon me, is a not-for-profit research organization incorporated in 1984 whose mission is to explore, understand, and explain the origin and nature of life in the universe and to use this knowledge to inspire and guide present and future generations, sharing knowledge with the public, the press, and the government. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. The institute consists of three primary centers. The Carl Sagan Center, devoted to the study of life in the universe. The Center for Education, focused on astronomy, astrobiology, and space science for students and educators. And the Center for Public Outreach, which produces quote-unquote big Big Picture Science, the Institute's general science radio show and podcast, SETI Talks, its weekly colloquium series. I need to follow that podcast. That sounds cool. Carl Sagan, uh, who much, um, who actually exactly like uh, Albert Einstein, Uh, famously uh, supported socialism and found it as the only logical way of continuing this human experiment because capitalism collapses. It's built in. Uh, It is an inherent flaw, and it is not apostate to say so. It's scientific. It's math. It does not work. Anyway, the Carl Sagan Center is named in honor of Carl Sagan, a former trustee of the Institute, uh, astronomer and uh, prolific author and host of the original Cosmos television series. The Carl Sagan Center is home to over 80 scientists and researchers organized around six research thrusts, astronomy and astrophysics, exoplanets, planetary exploration, climate and geoscience, astrobiology, and SETI. Guided by the astrobiology roadmap charted by the Drake Equation, I'm not sure what that is, uh, scientists of the Carl Sagan Center endeavor uh, to understand the nature and proliferation of life in the universe and the transitions from physics to chemistry, chemistry to biology, and biology to philosophy. Most of the research undertaken within the Carl Sagan Center is funded by grants from NASA, while SETI endeavors are funded exclusively by private philanthropy. The Institute's SETI researchers use both radio and optical telescope systems to search for deliberate signals from technologically advanced extraterrestrial civilizations. The SETI Institute employs over 100 researchers that study all aspects of the search for life, its origins, the environment in which life develops, and its ultimate fate. They include Lawrence Doyle, Peter Jenkins, uh, Jeniskins, Pascal Lee, Mark R. Showalter, Frank Marcus Marches, and Janice Bishop. Um, yada, yada, yada. 
running out of let, let's jump ahead here instruments instruments used by uh seti institute scientists include the ground-based allen telescope array uh eh, let's go ahead um here here's a short section on history and then we'll move along i'm running out of time the seti institute was incorporated as a California nonprofit organization in 1984 by Thomas Pearson, former CEO, and Dr. Jill Tarter. Financial and leadership support over the uh, life of the SETI Institute has included Carl Sagan, Bernard Oliver, David Packard, William Hewlett, Gordon Moore, Paul Allen, let's see his uh, card, Nathan Mirvold. Louis Platt and Greg Papadopoulos. <laughs> Greek names are fun. Two Nobel laureates have been associated with the SETI Institute. Charles Towns, a key inventor of the laser, and the late uh, Baruch Blumberg, who developed the hepatitis B vaccine. That's cool. Within the SETI Institute, Andrew Simeon heads the SETI effort. Seth Shostak is the host of Big Picture Science. David, Dr. David Morrison was the director of the Carl Sagan Center until August 2015 when Natalie Cabral uh, was appointed as the director, so on and so forth. And then a whole lot more names and everything. It, it, it's still going on. Uh, in in 20, January 2019, it was reported that the Institute was looking for moons around 486958 Arokoth. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, and then moving on to this thing. So, 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 so. I have had this idea for I don't know how long, for a very, very long time. And it is that what if, I, you know, and I swear I've talked about this on here before. What if um, we are getting signs and they're not that far away? Um, and I've, I've associated this with like uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and things that we regard as uh, paranormal activity. What if the few things we pick up are but leakage into the spectrum of phenomena that humans are able to perceive? My go-to thing is, uh, can you hear a dog whistle? No, because dogs don't have lips. But I guess they do have lips, but they can't work it that way and they can't really blow out of their mouths like that. Or if they can, maybe they don't know how to go. <whistles> you can't hear a dog whistle, the actual device, because it hits. It, dogs can hear it. It exists, but it hits a sound frequency that humans, the human ear cannot hear. And there are there's a vast spectrum of light wavelengths, light rays that humans can't perceive. So we have built instruments that can perceive things that our bodies, our, our organic instruments cannot perceive. But then again, even our measures, even our tools, even our vernacular is limited. There are things that we simply don't know that we don't know. There are things, there are even things that we don't know that we do know. This is, uh, these fall within categories of knowledge, of knowing and unknowing. Um, so my thing is, what if we're getting stuff all the time, we just can't pick it up? And, you know, there you, you may hear about like the search for carbon-based life. Could there not be some other form of life that we simply don't know, simply cannot conceive of? I've thought about this for decades now because I'm decades old, and it seems I'm not the only one. I saw this on a uh, website called supercluster.com. Um, this article was published August 12, 2021, written by Daniel Oberhaus, titled, 
would we recognize an extraterrestrial message if we received one? Um, last year marked the 60th anniversary of Project Ozma, the world's first scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, uh, was also the beginning of a decades-long exercise in patience and tenacity. Astronomers have yet to detect any evidence of alien intelligence in the Milky Way, despite spending thousands of hours scanning the cosmos for radio signals carrying extraterrestrial tidings. Given the sheer number of star systems in the galaxy that we know host planets, many of which appear to be habitable, the science is conspicuous. Astronomers have posed a number of theories about why we have not received an extraterrestrial message, ranging from the obvious possibilities that we're monitoring the wrong wavelengths or uh, targeting the wrong stars. Uh, oh yeah, going back to my, my theory is uh, stuff exists on wavelengths that we can't perceive, and it's all around us, probably in us. Anyway, um targeting wrong stars to more imaginative explanations such as the zoo hypothesis, which suge suggests aliens know we exist and are choosing not to talk to us, meaning we're in a zoo, much like uh, what's-his-name in Slaughterhouse-Five or like at the end of 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, humans were kept in a human zoo observed by beings um, that exist beyond our comprehension, uh, the extent of our human limited comprehension. Arguably, the most disturbing theory was put forth by an astronomer, not by an astronomer, but by a psychologist named Jack Baird. He raised the possibility that the reason we haven't heard from aliens yet is due to the fundamental limits of the human mind. It may very well be the case that extraterrestrials are sending messages and we simply are incapable of perceiving them, much like we are incapable, oh my god, of hearing beyond a narrow range of frequencies. Holy shit. Holy shit. I know there's a term for having an idea that someone else had an idea of, and it's not when, you know, you get information filtered through into your subconscious. No. Uh, original novel thoughts can occur simultaneously, perhaps split by linear time and geography, but split nonetheless. Anyway, oh, where were we going? Uh, la, 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 la. Frequencies, if true, this raises the important question of whether we can overcome the natural cognitive limits that prevent us from tapping into the cosmic discourse, and if so, how we go about doing it. It's an atypical question for a discipline, but that is focused, uh, that is typically focused on purely technical challenges of interstellar communication. But Baird was not your typical alien hunter. After completing a PhD at Princeton in 1964, the mild-mannered 26-year-old returned to his native Vermont, where he spent the rest of his career studying the intricacies of the human mind at Dartmouth College. Baird's specialty was uh, psychophysics. Interesting. I've never heard that. Psychophysics, a branch of psychology focused on the relationship between the brain and the external world. He was fascinated with how humans perceive everything from numbers on a screen to raw physical space and wrote hundreds of papers detailing the effects of external stimuli on our mental processes. Fascinating work to be sure, but seemingly remote from anything having to do with extraterrestrial intelligence. NASA thought otherwise. In 1979, the agency tapped Baird to join a study group designed to determine whether it was feasible to detect radio signals from an extraterrestrial intelligence. Today, NASA is not formally involved with SETI, but at the time, the agency was seriously considering the prospect of communicating with aliens elsewhere in the galaxy. And I... I I don't know this for sure, but I 
venture to speculate, and I feel it's safe to say the reason NASA got into it is because the Soviets were already doing it. That was like all of the, during the Cold War, all of the great technological advances the U.S. made, it's because the Soviets were already doing it because they were like, now that we're not, you know, squabbling over stupid shit necessarily, um, despite the very faulty bureaucratic system the Soviets set up, um, they were like, let's advance technology. Let's advance, uh, you know, human existence. And uh, the U.S. said, well, we can't be shown up. We can't let the fucking commies show us up. And so that was the drive for technical technological advancement uh, in the U.S. during the Cold War. It's because Soviet Union was already doing it, and the U.S. was like, well, we can't look bad. That's it. For the most part, I, I think it's safe to speculate on that. Oh, shit, where was I? Um, NASA, it had begun assembling teams of scientists to research the technical and conceptual issues involved with the scientific SETI program, such as identifying the best radio frequencies to monitor for signals and the most likely star systems to host intelligent life. But NASA realized there were also important human factors that uh, SETI needed to address, which is how Baird and Tyler Blake, a psychologist at California State University, became the only scientists who weren't physicists, astronomers, or engineers involved in the agency's early SETI efforts. The basic question is the duo, uh, the basic question the two sought to answer was whether humans would recognize an extraterrestrial signal if we received one. Although today SETI relies on sophisticated computer programs and artificial intelligence uh, to identify promising candidate signals in radio telescope data, in 1979, it wasn't so obvious that computers would be up to the task of sifting through all of this cosmic noise without some human assistance. The problem is that any radio message we receive on Earth will likely be very faint by the time it reaches us and may be very hard to distinguish from the background radio noise of the universe since we can't know in advance what form this message will take. As part of their research for NASA, Blake and Baird recruited 18 volunteers and tasked them with identifying simulated intelligent signals against a background of cosmic noise. The subjects were exposed to dozens of displays of identif then identified the ones they thought contained an intelligent signal and their confidence in their judgment. Baird and Blake made a few surprising discoveries from the experiment. First, some signals, such as straight lines, were generally harder to detect than wavy or pulsed signals. Makes sense. Lack of novelty in a straight line. Second, for any given signal, the subject frequently would divide into two distinct groups. One group that was very confident that they saw a signal and one that didn't see the signal at all. Baird and Blake published their paper in 1982 and recommended that future research compare the accuracy of human detectors versus computers. Interestingly, they remarked that humans have an advanced or have an advantage over computers because they don't need the types of signals they're searching for to be specified beforehand. But this is now well within the capabilities of modern AI. Although Baird never did a follow-up study on signal detection with NASA, his research revealed the deep connection between human cognition and the prospects of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. He realized that if we were ever going to detect an alien message, it was critical to identify and, if necessary, correct for the biases introduced into the search uh, due to the nature of of human psychology. A few years after he completed the NASA study, Baird published The Inner Limits of Outer Space, which is the first and only book to grapple with the psychological aspects of SETI. It is a work that raises 
far more questions than it answers, which probably accounts for its relative obscurity. A few years ago, the author of this article wrote a book about uh, designing messages for extraterrestrials that required a comprehensive survey of the literature, and I did not find Baird's book cited anywhere, even once. Interesting. Although it may not have attracted the attention of the wider SETI community, the issues it grapples with uh, are uh, grapples with could be fundamentally important to future research. Uh, the, the inner limits of outer space draws on Baird's background in the psychophysics. I'm, I, if I were to, uh, you know, go back into school, I think I might want to study some psychophysics because this is absolutely a topic uh, that I'm just like innately interested in and always have been. Uh, the relation between psychology and our experience of existence. Um, to examine the ways that SETI is influenced by the way our brains receive and process sensory information. One of the book's main insights is that, quote, people project human qualities into space and attribute human motivation to aliens, unquote. Yeah, yeah. In some ways, this is a necessary prerequisite to the search. Uh, we must assume that aliens like us want to communicate with an intelligent species on another planet, but it can also uh, bias the types of signals we look for by assuming that the aliens also think and perceive as we do. Today, for example, SETI is mostly focused on looking for narrow band signals in specific regions of the radio spectrum, and many researchers assume they will likely have mathematical qualities such as a pulsed signal representing the numbers. Which kind of math? Base 2, base 10, base 12? There's all sorts of math. There's math that we don't even fucking know about yet. But Baird points out that this is a bias introduced into the search because it is largely driven by scientists and engineers who may be accustomed to thinking about communication problems in a specific way. Quote, the strategy for contacting alien life depends critically on our assumptions, unquote. Further quote, if we think the alien mentality is comparable to ours, then it makes good sense to use standard techniques to make content, writes, uh, contact, writes Baird. Quote, a rich variety of intelligences is found in the human population, but only one type places heavy weight on scientific thinking. My point is only that the language of science is not outside the psychological constraints that determine all other modes of human expression, unquote. The form of the message we are looking for is greatly biased by other human factors, such as their timing. We expect extraterrestrial messages to be received on human timescales, such as over the course of several minutes, hours, or days. But what if the alien civilization has lifespans that are substantially longer than ours and sends a message whose pattern is only decipherable by monitoring it over the course of years, decades, or millennia? We might never realize we are receiving that message because we will not notice the pattern on that timescale. Oh my God. God, I'm having a mindgasm reading this, babies. It would be easy to read Inner Limits as a pessimist take on SETI, but that would be a mistake. Baird takes a clear-eyed view at the way human psychology influences our attempts to find messages in the cosmic noise and acknowledges the intractable challenges it creates. He offers a few solutions for overcoming our innate biases, which range from fanciful ideas about training dolphins for signal detection to pragmatic suggestions about humans collaborating with computers to identify potential messages. But his fundamental message is that, regardless of whether we ever actually detect an alien signal, the pursuit of this goal is one of the best ways to understand what it means to be human because it pushes us to the extremes of our capabilities and forces us to grapple with our limitations. And if the search is successful, first contact could extend the frontier of human capabilities in ways that may never have been possible on our own. 
From Baird's perspective, SETI is a total win-win regardless of the outcome. Quote, The complexity of the search should be cause for involvement, not despair, Baird writes. Also, the or, although the psychological boundaries of the human mind, or human thought and expression may seem manifest, these could be illusory. The actual potential of the human mind may be realized only when external conditions demand more, in which case the full story of humanity will not be told until we cope with the altogether unique conditions of interacting with an alien being of the same or higher intellect, end quote. Baird never lived to see the first contact, a see first contact, nor did he expect to. He recognized that the challenges faced by SETI might take centuries, if not millennia, to overcome, if they could be overcome at all. Baird's legacy lives on in the generation of alien hunters like Kevin Peter Hand, who were inspired by his work. Hand is a planetary scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he helps lead a team uh, building the robots that may one day explore the subsurface oceans of Europa, which many astrobiologists think may have the conditions for life. Hand studied with Baird as an undergraduate at Dartmouth and would frequently discuss the possibility of extraterrestrial life with Baird over coffee after class. That sounds like a really cool time. Quote, we would grab coffee and talk about SETI and the sensory perception problem at hand. Hand. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> sensory perception problem of contact. Hand says... I ended up double majoring in psychology and physics in no small part because of Jack's influence. He had a wonderfully curious mind, and I think he enjoyed talking about these things with someone studying in the physics department, unquote. A copy of Inner Limits sits on a shelf in Han's office at NASA, and although he isn't in the business of looking for intelligent aliens, he says he finds Baird's book to be a source of inspiration and a reminder to be careful, assuming too much about what alien life might be like. Quote, Jack was trying to break out of the constraints of our own psychological and sensory perception limitations, unquote, says Hand. You've got to be a bit fearless when it comes to the search for life in the universe, especially intelligent life, because it's not really a field that is taken tremendously seriously academically, but it's, it's a profoundly important endeavor, and he encouraged me to stay fearless and to continue uh, to pursue this stuff. Further quote from Hand. Um, and that's about it. That's really about it for that article. And that's all for this episode. Thanks for tuning in. Once again, uh, the show could use your support and you, maybe you could use 90 bonus episodes and you can access all that at patreon.com slash that thing with James. Link is in the episode description. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope to catch you next time. Bye.